<laughs> I just want to be sexy too. No, you don't. I do. You don't. Oh, thanks. It's so hard being sexy, isn't it's it? It's a hard life. It's a hard life. What's up, everybody? It's Maxwell Mooney here with Narrative Coffee, and we have with us Josh Modisset. Hey, Josh, how are you? Hi, good. Good. Uh, Josh is our assistant manager, and he's also like the the brewer extraordinaire on our team. And uh, yeah, I know he's not actually that good, but anyway, we're going to put him in front of a camera today. But we wanted to talk to you about brewing, and um, we're going to kind of walk over a little bit of how we brew coffee here, and then we want to talk a little bit about coffee itself, um, some grind settings, and how to use a little bit of some basic information to inform how you brew a little bit at home. So coffee is the seed of a tropical fruit um, and that seed material is primarily composed of woody bits. So like cellulose and lignin are kind of the main composition of the coffee's um, structure itself. So most of that is insoluble. So it, it's not easily put into water, but there is a percentage of coffee, roughly 30 to 40-ish percent of it can go into water. And that's what we call the soluble parts. Basically, all you need to know is that coffee, um, as you take more out of it, moves from tasting, having a strong presence of acids into sugars. And then if you go a little bit too far and you take too much out of it, it'll start moving into bitter flavors. So you kind of want to use that, that spectrum from uh, sour and acids into sweetness into bitterness as a guide for how you can get your coffee to taste the best at home. Now, the way that you do that, there's a number of different ways of making your coffee more or less soluble, right? So you can use hotter water, you can use more water, you can use less water to take less out. Uh, you can make your grind size, uh, you can adjust it and make it bigger or smaller. That'll expose more surface area or less surface area, so you can take more or less out. So I have kind of a range of grind sizes here for you to take a look at. So we're gonna get some close-ups of this. But we have over here, we have our coarsest grind setting. This is something more like what you would use in a French press. Over here is kind of a medium coarse grind. This is something like you'd use for a Chemex or maybe like a Mr. Coffee Pot. Uh, this over here is um, kind of a medium, medium fine. This is what we would use for a um, V60, which is what we use here. And then this is kind of a finer grind that you would use for like an AeroPress. Um, depending on your AeroPress recipe, those are really versatile. We could probably talk about those at some point, but um, this is kind of my, what I would start with with my AeroPress recipe, which is used as a fine grind. And then over here, we get into espresso territory. So this is like an espresso grind. And then over here, we have the finest grind that our grinder will get us. And this is like almost powderized, and you would use this for like Turkish coffee, or if you were gonna make like a cup of cowboy coffee. Cup of cowboy coffee. you didn't have a filter, you could use a setting of this fineness. Although you might actually find that the coarsest setting would do just as good for you, but that's maybe a different discussion for a different day. So these are different grind setting sizes. And um, they break down the coffee into more uh, smaller pieces, except water more readily because they have more surface area exposed. The larger pieces take a little bit more time. All right, so there's three stages of brewing. There's the saturation stage, there's diffusion and there's dissolution. Now those are all big sciencey words, but basically you gotta get water inside the coffee in order for you to extract coffee particles out of the coffee. So it's, water's gotta get inside, gas has to get out. We call that the bloom phase. So basically when you see, um, we'll pour a little bit of water on the coffee first, roughly twice its own weight, and we'll let it kind of bubble and gas off. That's because all the gas that's trapped inside the coffee cell walls is escaping and water's penetrating into it. Once we have full saturation of the coffee particles, then we can add some more water and we'll kind of keep doing that consistently and evenly. And that stage is called the diffusion stage. And if you want to get down into some of the science behind it, it's when um, osmosis starts to really occur. So if you remember back to science class, um, osmosis is where you have a semi-permeable membrane, which in this case is the coffee itself. And you have liquid on either side of it and you have one side of it that has more solutes inside of it. So more, more stuff that's not water, and then you have like fresh water on the other side, and then the particles travel from the, the more concentrated side and they slide over to the other side until they kind of reach equilibrium or equal amounts of solids on both sides of that membrane. 
Then, after that has happened, that's the diffusion, so that's the movement of those solutes through that membrane. Uh, once that's happened, then the water can fall out, and it falls out of the rest of the solution, which we would call dissolution. So that's where you actually get coffee falling out of your brewer into your cup that you can then drink. So those are the three stages of brewing, and Josh is going to demonstrate them for us in just a sec. Sick. Go for it, Josh. You want, are you going to count me down and just go? Go for it. Cool. Hey, I'm gonna get to brew some coffee today. Today I'm brewing with the Worry Milk Coffee from the Gadeo Zone in Ethiopia, roasted by Pinstock Coffee. There's a few things you wanna do whenever you're getting ready to brew a pour over, whether it's you use a, a conical filter like this or a flat bottom filter. Um, temperature loss is a huge issue in brewing coffee, and so you wanna do two things. If you're gonna use a paper filter, you wanna get it wet with hot water, and you also wanna to try to bring this conical filter up to temperature. So I'm just gonna be pouring hot water right over it. I just did over here, but I'm gonna do it again just to demonstrate. This rinses the paper flavor out of the filter, but it also brings my conical filter brewing device up to temperature, which is great. Also, you wanna grind coffee. It's recommended to grind coffee with a, not a blade grinder, but with some sort of um, grinder using burrs conical or flat, depending on your preference. They both have their advantages. After you grind your coffee for the appropriate size of what you're brewing into, get all of the coffee grounds wet so that we can have all the grounds evenly saturated first, and then we can start extracting coffee. So I'm gonna do that right now. I'm basically just trying to get as much, or the water in as fast as possible, so that I can get all the grounds wet evenly and I'm gonna swirl it just to kinda of make sure everything is all evenly wet. And I'm gonna wait. What's happening is we're letting the CO2 gas get out of the way um, and so that we can have the water come in and infiltrate the coffee seed itself. Um, this basically just enhances flavor, makes a really great brewing, tasting brewing cup. Um, you're gonna taste a lot more clarity in a cup if you do this versus if you just get all the water in right away. Another thing to remember is you want water pretty hot, uh, right below boiling temperature, somewhere in between 195 and 205 is recommended. We brew a little bit hotter just because we like to make sure, make up for temperature loss. Uh, right now what I'm doing is I'm gonna just basically be pouring in a swirling motion. There are a few different techniques where people do swirls or they'll do uh, zigzags and they'll do anything from pulse pouring to continuous pouring. I just like to play it simple. I'm doing a swirl pour pattern and I'm just pouring continuously. Um, it's just much easier to control my variables at this, uh, way, this way, especially for new people who are learning to make pour overs. Uh, but the most important thing, doesn't matter what your swirl pattern is or whatever, you just wanna make sure that this stream is a, continual, is a continuous uh, flow. Um, what I mean by that is basically you don't want to do this thing where you go faster on one end and slower on the other. Um, this is going to cause over extraction on one side and under extraction on the other, which doesn't make for a great tasting cup. Um, so again, I'm just doing a swirling motion here, but I'm really focusing on making sure that my pour stream is steady, uh, just so I can make sure that the entire brew is going to be a consistent, at a consistent extraction. This uh, certain, uh, this particular coffee, I'm doing a uh, brew ratio of around one to 16. I think that's right, uh, 25 grams in, and I'm doing 375 grams of coffee out. Might be 16 and a half. And for a total uh, pour time of around two minutes, there's that. So this is about as slow as I can pour using this fellow kettle right here. That's when it, or the water is breaking and you start seeing more drops come out. That's not exactly the right pour speed for a V60 because you want to have a little bit faster of a pour speed than that. I was going for more of a pour speed like, like this, if that makes any sense. Uh, what you don't want to do is something like this in a V60, where it's a really, really fast flow rate. Um, that's just basically going to make, th make the water spin, uh, speed right through the coffee bed without really even extracting much coffee on its way down. So you're going to get a really watery cup. Um, and what I was saying before of what you want to avoid is this action where you're, you're pouring and then you're, you're doing an accelerated uh, pour on one side and then, a, and then a decelerated pour on the other side. That's going to cause your over and your under extraction, which isn't going to cause uh, which is going to make an unbalanced cup, which is what you don't want to do. You want to have a continuous pour. That's why I suggest just pouring slow in a circle for people that I'm teaching to do this too. 
It's also a good practice that I've seen some people do that after they've done finished brewing their pour, just to pick it up and just give it a little spin. What this is going to do is this is going to redistribute the coffee seeds down towards the bottom of the conical filter. Coffee is going to take the path of least resistance, which basically means it's going to find the least, um, the easiest way for it to get through the coffee bed. Um, and it's going to it's going to shoot right through those those pathways that it creates. What that does, that little swirling motion, basically resets the coffee bed to where now the water is going to draw down at a consistent rate all the way through to where you don't have those pathways anymore, and you're just extracting the coffee evenly through the whole bed. Again, it's not necessary, but some people like to do it just to ensure that you have an even extraction all the way through. The last thing you want to do is when you're about to drink your coffee, give it a good swirl and maybe even get a spoon and stir it because uh, when you're brewing the coffee, you're obviously starting with the most uh, concentrated coffee that's going to be at the bottom and the least concentrated coffee that's going to be at the top of your carafe. And so when you're swirling or stirring it with a spoon, you're ensuring that all the coffee is evenly extracted or evenly mixed in, sorry, so that you can share with your friends, everyone's going to have a similar cup and that you can all enjoy a delicious cup of coffee together. Cheers. Just like a... I just burned my tongue. Sick. There it is.